will be blessed. Amen. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 1. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the uh, days of Herod, the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east. Now look at verses 11 and 12. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, and frankincense, and myrrh. I want to preach today a very simple thought is the gifts of the nativity. Everybody say gifts of the nativity. And before we pray today, uh, Sister Rafaela, raise your hand really high. This is another one of my sisters from another mister. She's very special to me in this church. And I was in my office Friday, was a week ago, just working. And I felt the Lord speak to me about preaching about these three gifts. And so I did not know this Tuesday. My sister had asked to speak to me, and I met with her and Sister Caban. And we had a very good, productive meeting, and we got to the end. She said, Pastor, Pastor, just one question. She's always got just one question. (laughs) Hours later, I got one more question. And she says, before I go, I have a question. What means the gifts that the wise men brought to Jesus? And she didn't know my heart flipped over. I said, okay, Lord, you might be in this. Who believes God can speak to us in advance and give us a word? Jesus, anoint our ears. Stir our heart today. Let us not just go through the motions. Let us not just be here, but God, let us be in your presence. And God, let your word speak to us and your spirit stir our hearts. And God, let us become on fire afresh with the revelation of who you are and what you want to do in us and through us. And let the church say, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, don't just sit down. Why don't you get out of your row and greet one another and say, I am glad you are in the house of the Lord today. Just so you know, I distributed evenly 64 cups of cheese over baked spaghetti yesterday. Just want to make sure I got your attention today. You may not realize this, but events affect cultural norms. Things happen to influence us To cause us to do what we do. And the greatest origin for the custom of exchanging gifts at Christmas comes from this passage. Where it talks about these wise men that 
journeyed from the east and they brought gifts, their treasures. Let me stop and say, if it didn't cost you anything, it ain't much of a gift. Some of y'all in the re-gifting business. Well, I could preach an hour on that. Where we get the concept of giving gifts at Christmas comes from this passage. And every child and every Amazon driver say amen. Mm. Now, I didn't have the gift of Amazon when I was a kid where you could go and provide your wish list somewhat like a bridal shower want list. When I was a kid, we were old school, Brother Randall. I'm old enough to remember Montgomery Ward's catalog. And then Sears and Roebuck came along. Come on. And then after Sears and Roebuck, we even got the J.C. Penney catalog. Come on. Somebody. And you would get a red marker and you would circle that uh, Tonka truck or fishing pole or Red Rider BB gun. Can I get a witness from somebody? You circle that. And you would leave it indiscriminately on the dining room table where mom would just happen to see it. And we thought we were being so covert. Ha he, ha he. As I've gotten older, it's less about the gifts. It's more about the giving. But one thing I still enjoy is getting a Christmas card. And I, and I hope you received a card from the church if you hadn't blamed the postal service. Because Sister Caban, worked, her little fingers are still just blistered. It is something that we emphasize here. We want everyone to know in written form, we do not apologize for the fact that we love you and you are important to us. And so some people will say it, other, other people won't put it in writing, because if you ever put it in writing, you got to live up to it. And we want to live up to it. We love you. And so, but over the years, I, I have gone shopping on behalf of Jewel and I, and sometimes on behalf of the church, looking for great Christmas cards. And we do put some thought into it. I think this year uh, we sent out joy, because we believe in joy, Jesus first, others second, and yourself third. One amen, two amen. We struggling. We we want to put your j, y o j. But I've run across some interesting Christmas cards. I ran across one that on the cover it said, "The three great Christmas lies." Ooh, that caught my attention. I said, "I got to look at see what that says on the inside." And so I, said, three great Christmas lies, and I opened it up, and it says, "Unbreakable, easy to assemble, and one size fits all." Those are the three big, I must not be an all because it didn't fit. One size fits, okay. Then I, I saw another one, Brother Randall, I thought of you because you and I are a lot alike. It says on the outside cover, I don't think I will get my wife anything for Christmas. I was like, hmm. I said, I got to open that and open it up. And on the inside it says, because she still hasn't used the snow shovel I got her last year. Baby, there ain't much snow in Tennessee. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I'm going to get you a weed eater. Hallelujah. Now, I ran across an article of the famous Ann Landers had written years ago, resurfaced recently. There was a lady who wanted to buy Christmas cards for people that she knew and care about, but she had no intention of buying them a gift. She says, I'll send them a little card and that'll absolve my uh, moral responsibility to buy a gift. And so she ran into the neighborhood Hallmark store and went inside. She was drawn towards a green covered card with a red heart and gold trimming on the outside of the card. And she just ran straight to it. And she read the cover and the cover says, from my heart to yours. And she's, oh, that just captivated my that's exactly what I want to say from my heart to yours and so she bought a box of these red and green and gold trimmed cards and she took them home and this card was unique for it was designed that on the back of the card is where you would sign it maybe put a personal note so she filled out a bunch of these cards and addressed them and put them in envelopes and she mailed them and she was so relieved to have that done and a few days later she's cleaning off the bar in her kitchen where she had filled out the cards and noticed the box was still there and there was one card left inside and she said I never opened the card to see what it said on the inside she said 
said, I got one card. Let me open it up. And she opened it up, and this is what it said on the inside. This card was sent to say that a little gift is on its way. Talking about scrambling for a last-minute gift, I do think there was probably some re-gifting there. Everybody say, amen. Now, The songwriter who used the terms hustle and bustle to describe this time of year really knew what he was talking about. Who knows there's not just Christmas, there's rounds of Christmas, like a heavyweight fight. There's the first round, the second round, the... The first round is the kids' school parties, and we got to have a gift for their teacher and their best friend. And then we may have a church party and, and the ladies meet and have secret Santa and they have that round of gifts and parties. And then there's work parties and then there's extended family get-togethers and you survive all of that. And then finally you get to your family and yes, those that are closest to you and you go, I lived. Everybody say, I lived. We're almost there, man. Just one or two more rounds and we're going. Now, let me say today. When we think of wise men, we think of the church Christmas play where you had three boys in robes with beach towels on their heads. And they're standing beside the shepherds. And then you've got a couple of angels with an old bed sheet and a coat hanger with tensely foil. And do I understand why we group all that together because it's part of the larger Christmas story. But I want you to know that from that although movies and plays have affected the timeline, it is obvious from this text today that there was months, if not years, between when Jesus was actually born in a manger and when these wise men came to Jesus. Our very text says that they came into the house. Didn't say they came into a stable and he wasn't laying in a manger. He was sitting in his mother's lap. And then you see, it doesn't call him the babe. That's what Luke's gospel calls him is the babe, Christ Jesus, our Lord. It it is the young child from the Greek here. It means almost a toddler. So we know that there's some time elapsed. They didn't come immediately, but they took a long time committed journey because of what they had read and understanded that this sign of a star in the sky indicated that there was a individual going to be born in Jerusalem at this time. Now, catch this. Sometimes it's what the Bible says and it's sometimes what the Bible doesn't say. We don't know these wise men's names. I know that around 700 A.D., someone wrote a play about Christmas, and they gave each one of the wise men names. But if you go to the Bible, you will not find a name of the wise men listed. That is a man-made derivative. We don't know how many wise men there were. We assume three. We imagine three because of three gifts, but it could have been substantially more in the grouping than that. What we do know is that they brought gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So we don't know the time in which they came exactly. We don't know their names or how many, nor exactly where they were or where they were from. But what we do know, and I think it's significant through the absence of information, that the Bible records the three gifts that they brought. Obviously, God's intention was for us to zero in the significance of the gift and what it implies. Now, uh, anybody here ever gone to a baby shower? Now, the world has progressed when Brian... Uh, was going to be born and we had a baby shower, uh, guys really weren't there. And I had to go hide for a couple hours. I couldn't hang around because the ladies are having a baby shower. We've progressed now. Now couples go together to baby showers. But no wise couple will let the man pick out the gift for the baby shower. Because we think every child needs a hammer or a crescent wrench. Come on, somebody help me. Yeah, I think that kid needs a shotgun. Come on. Billy Bubba. 
Let the, let the woman, they, they're more cognizant, more sensitive to what that baby might be. Who, who admits that gender can affect the gift that we give? Maybe it's an article of clothing that if it's a boy, blue, and if it's a girl, pink. If it's a girl, maybe a hair bow. If a boy, maybe a ball cap. Now, we understand with the baby shower that it is based on the need or or usefulness to the child of what we buy okay now who's ever graduated from something okay you graduated from something you graduate from high school uh, and you're going on to college you might buy that graduate a uh, pen and pencil set who remembers getting a mechanical pen and pencil set for graduation and then you might get them a reverse notation scientific calculator by Hewlett Packard because they're going to have advanced math and they're going to need it. Or you might buy them an article of clothing bearing the name of the school, the university, the college they're going to attend. Well, I'm not going to college. Well, if they're going to trade school, then you buy them that complete set of craftsman tools, Christian. You got to get one amen back there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. If they're going, they're going to be an electrician, you might buy them an electrical toolkit, etc. Trade school. What you buy them is predicated on what their pursuit is. What if they're going to graduate school? They're going to be a doctor or a lawyer. You'd get a doctor, possibly a stethoscope. What if it's a lawyer? You'd get them possibly a briefcase. Do you understand that the gift is related to what they need or an acknowledgement of the position or purpose in which they're going to school. Everybody understand. If you don't get that, you're not going to get this message today. In other words, the, the position or the purpose of the individual affects the gifts that are provided to them. And so it is true of the gifts that were presented to Jesus. His first gift mentioned was gold. I think gold was listed first because it's the metal of all metals. Its characteristic is, did you know that one single ounce of gold can be squashed? That's called malleability. It can be squeezed out into, one ounce can be squeezed out into foil-like that would be approximately 10 foot by 10 foot, 100 square feet out of one inch because it is so malleable. It is so uh, ductile, meaning it is able to be stretched, that one ounce of gold can be spun out into a 50 foot, mile, excuse me, a 50 mile long piece of wire. It's it's very malleable. It's very ductile. It's very uh, flexible, usable. It can be bench, boiled, shaped, hewed, sculpted. It conducts electricity. It has reflective properties. It is easy to become an alloy. In other words, you can introduce other metals and compounds to modify what it does. Did you know no acid is able in itself to destroy it? Did you catch what I just said? It is undestroyable in its natural form. In Jesus' day, they already had established what we call today the gold standard. Nothing measured up to gold. I know people are talking about digital currency and Bitcoin today. Give me good old gold. Two or three amens. You ever heard those commercials? They're trying to sell vinyl siding or they're trying to sell stucco or other outside building materials. And they'll say, just as good as brick. Do you know why they say just as good as brick? Because everybody wants to be the Cadillac of building materials, which is brick. And when they start saying it's good as gold, you can write it down. It ain't good. At, because gold is the absolute best metal. Now, here's what I want you to get today. This gift truly reveals that Jesus is royalty because gold is always synonymous with royalty. Jesus, the gift the wise men gave him, is not a gift you would give a pauper, a brick mason, or a ditch digger. 
They'd say, what are you doing with gold? Because you're just a brick mason or a ditch digger. But when they gave him gold, it fit because their understanding of who he was based on biblical prophecy was he wasn't just one of many. He was the one and only king of kings and lord of lords. They gave him, just like you would give a doctor a stethoscope, you give the king gold. Their gift indicated their revelation and understanding. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. Nathaniel said, I declare him to be king over Israel. John chapter 12, the people begin to shout and they begin to dance and they begin to put palm branches down singing Hosanna. Hos-. But they didn't just sing Hosanna. The word says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the king of Israel. Let him be. I'm here to tell you that the people and even the rocks would cry out because everybody, except Herod, because he didn't want to recognize it, everybody knew there was something special about him. They brought him gold because he was coming in majesty. He was royalty. He was God in skin. He was the alpha. He was the omega. He's the beginning and the end. In him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Pilate even asked him at his trial, his mock trial. Pilate being governor set up by Rome as a dictating army occupying Jerusalem. And they had buffeted him and they had mocked him and they had put a crown of thorns on him. And they marched him out in front of Pilate and says, these Jews say that you believe you're king of the Jews. Jesus being humble, not bragging on himself saying, yeah, I'm awesome. He answered, it is as you say. See, his humble humanity would not allow him to say, I'm king. But he couldn't deny the authority that had been invested in him. As they say it is, he is king of kings and lord of lords. The Bible says that Mary and Joseph had to go to Bethlehem, the city of David, to be taxed. Because you had to go back to your lineage for every family to gather to be taxed. Can I give you a word? David was the greatest king that Israel had ever known. But David said, I look for a day that there will be a king of the lineage of David that will be no end. He will be righteous. He will be holy. He will be fair. He will be loving. His scepter will touch mercy and his fingers will extend grace. I'm telling somebody today the reason they gave him gold. He's a king that loves his creation and he's willing to come and meet your needs needs wherever you're at today without end have I got a few more minutes his second gift his second gift frankincense say that with me frankincense I didn't say frankincense I say frankincense frankincense and that word sense at the end implies there's an aroma related to our senses connected it is a sap from a tree that is primarily found in a region of Ethiopia and Saudi Arabia. Those who harvest this are very much like the people in Vermont who cut into the bark of the maple tree and allow the the sap to ooze out into buckets and they make maple syrup. Everybody say amen. Ooh, I'm feeling some good buttery French toast and pouring some Mrs. Butterworth on. I've done been up eight hours and it still sounds good. Come on. Okay. Just as you would harvest maple sap, they harvest the sap of these trees. And that's where uh, we get frankincense. And it kind of hardens. They take a knife or a sharp object and scrape it off. And it becomes almost like a goldish clear crystal, if you will, as it hardens. And you can, you can light it on fire and it'll burn. It's got a petroleum base to it. It'll burn, but it puts out a very bright white light and and they say it emits a uh, wooden earthy and fruity smell I, I can't imagine those together woody earthy and fruity together they say it's very pleasurable to the ear excuse me to the nose oh to the ear very pleasurable to the ear hallelujah you won't remember my sermon but you'll remember that won't you yeah did you know that it's considered the purest of all the uh, senses of the incense family. 
Now, what you may not know, the significance of why the wise men would bring this to Jesus. What does a kid need with a fragrancy sap, uh, an, an incense, if you will? What you may not realize is the biblical formula to be anointed priest in Israel is they would take pure olive oil and they would crush up frankincense and blend them together. And that's how a high priest would be anointed. In other words, without frankincense, you couldn't be a priest. Because when the high priest who had been anointed, he didn't only have the oil of the anointing, he also had the fragrance that when he came in, you could sense his presence among the people. Did you know that it was also blended in the offerings? Never offerings for sin, but offerings for praise and for worship to God. If they offered a drink offering or, or a uh, bread offering or an offering of praise, that they would add this, this uh, fragrance of incense to it. Also, it was added to a compound at the altar of incense. In other words, that one time a year that the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, he would stop and get a coal from the altar and he would put in this thing that looks like one of those fireplace popcorn poppers or bed warmers. And he would take that and scoop up a, a live coal and then he would stop at the altar of incense and he would grab a handful of this pre-developed compound and he'd put it on that, that, that hot ember and he would slide it behind the curtain and it would fill the Holy of Holies with a cloud. And that cloud Cloud created a cloud-like veil where one time a year the high priest could step in to the Shekinah presence of God. Can I tell you, it was frankincense that allowed the great high priest, when Jesus was on the cross, he didn't go, he didn't uh, linger there. The Bible says that a hand from heaven reached in toward the temple veil, that which had been separated from, from mankind now. There is no barrier because the man Christ Jesus became a veil He's constantly making atonement and intercession. These wise men said, I'm so glad I may have walked a long way from the east. I may have camel sores on my backside, but I came bearing gifts that indicate I know your position and your power. You come before a holy God to represent a sinful people and our confidence. Our confidence is that you can make a way where there had been no way. We have a high priest that's not afraid of the feelings of our infirmities. But he was an always tempted and tested like as we are. But he without sin has made a way where there was. I feel the Holy Ghost in here today. This gift was an indication of his position. He was a high priest that was going to make a difference for a lost and dying world. I'm hurrying today. Did you know that frankincense was added to the bread on the table of showbread? You couldn't consume the word without tasting the frankincense that was... Who's ever been weary and well-doing, about to give up and go along, and you go to the Word of God and a light from heaven zeroes in on a verse, and you just need a word. And I know this book was written and put together thousands of years ago, but God's finger wrote it for me today, and I go to that word when I was about to give up, and God will speak through His Word. When we consume the word, there's the frankincense. There's the presence of the high priest that's saying, don't give up. You can make it. I've covered a multitude of sins. I've brought you a mighty long way. I delivered you out of Egypt. I've got you a sure foundation. You can make it. You can make it. I know you're weary, but don't give up. Aren't you glad that frankincense is in the word? The priest is speaking through his word. I, I'm skipping stuff. He was anointed, Jesus was anointed, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. I know we preach that about the year of Jubilee. And Jesus reading Isaiah in their synagogue preaching the acceptable the year of the Lord. And we saw what happened. Those who were in prison were ministered to. And those who were sick and afflicted and neglected. And the poor were, were, their needs were met. I understand all that. But the great thing about the acceptable year of the Lord is that it's a revelation that no matter where we've been, we might have did it to ourselves. We might have hawked ourselves. We might have ignored warning after warning. We got ourselves addicted or in trouble or astray. 
estranged from family, but our God is an intercessor no matter how you got where you're at. Our God is a priest that's not of afraid of your affliction. You can't go too far. You can't do too much that our God is not able to reach you and extend his mercy to you and restore all that the enemy has taken. I'm here to tell somebody today we got a high priest and the magi, the wise men, knew he was more than just a baby by their gifts. The wise men's gifts revealed they knew he was a mediator between God and man. Not just a king, but a priest after the order of Melchizedek. You can look that up in your own time. It's a great resource. And the third gift was a spice. We got any spice girls in here? <laughs> Spicy girls in here? I know we got a couple of sassy girls in here. Who, who, who likes spice? Who likes spice? Louisiana hot sauce. Kung Pao peppers. Come on. So, mm. so They say old men put black pepper on everything because they can't taste anything. I'm going to pay for that later, I got a feeling. Black pepper gives a little spice, a little flavor. Okay. It's an additive. The third gift, the third treasure was myrrh. Myrrh. It was used as an embalming agent. Remember when Jesus died that Joseph of Arimathea used over 100 pounds of this spice on Jesus' body. At their day, they didn't have an internal process of embalming like we do today with formaldehyde. They had an external embalming process. They would put layers of fabric and they would smear or spread this myrrh, the spice, over it and then put more layers and more myrrh until it created a covering. And really what it did is it curbed the stench of death and it was a keeping agent, almost a preservative, <clears throat> if you will. Now, let me go back to the ladies talking about the baby shower. Which lady in here, in your right mind, would take a bottle of embalming fluid to a baby shower? Anybody? Nobody? That'd be kind of, do what? Kind of offensive or like. Now, <clears throat> I know it's a point a man wants to die in the judgment, but you don't want to lead with that, okay? Not at a... So could you see where it might be a little of a head scratcher? Because Mary and Joseph knew that myrrh's primary uh, usage was an embalming agent. Do you understand that the wise men were acknowledging what we know to be true today is that Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. He is a high priest who facilitates a right union with God. And yes... To atone for the sins of man. Jesus said it this way, Brother Alford. He said, for this cause came I into the world. Jesus wasn't in the wrong place at the wrong time. He wasn't caught unaware. He went to Jerusalem. He said, for my time has come that I might be. Even the death of the cross, I know. Nobody deceived him. He wasn't at the wrong place at the wrong time. He was at the right place at the right time. He was at the crossroads for your future and my future. Jesus came knowing he was going to die. Not to die in vain, but to die on purpose that you might live and live eternally. Jesus was born. Born, that he may die, that you and I may live. Get it today. Their gifts indicated. Now remember what I said about myrrh? Myrrh kind of covered the stench. And myrrh kind of uh, encapsulated what was going on. It was a preservative. I love what 1 Corinthians says. Oh death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through the Lord. 
gives us the victory through the Lord Jesus. I'm telling you, when we put on Christ as a garment, he's a covering. It's asbestos that will prevent the flames from hell. No weapon formed against you shall prosper when you are dead in trespasses and sin and you become dead. You take on Christ as a garment and you come forward as a new creature. Hell has no authority. The devil has... I thought I was in a Pentecostal church today. I've come to tell the devil, he's got the victory over you. You thought you had him, but he had you. For in his perfect death and resurrection, we have hope for eternal life. It don't matter where we've been. God's already been there. He's descended into hell. He's led captivity captive, and he's speaking to you today. If you will honor his position and his purpose, if you'll acknowledge him for who he is, he can bring you out of the pit. He can break the shackles of addiction. He can put marriages back together. He can lift off the spirit of depression and despair my God is able come on stand to your feet today you're in the right place today you're in the right place today Jill and I came to this town I tell people I pastor the best church anywhere best best church anywhere because we're the only church in the book of Revelation that got a positive report. He said, I know you're suffering. But he said, you've come forth like gold. The church of Smyrna is the only church of the seven churches that got a... I thought y'all get excited about that. Ooh, I go to church of Smyrna. Can't touch this. Oh, no, no, no. Can't touch this. Come on. Julie, back me up. But for the first years we were here, there's some people that are from this town. They don't say Smyrna. 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 I was like, do what? We roll with it, you know. Don't ever listen to the weather radio that it tries to say Laverne. Lagavergna. Lagavergna. Smyrna. But did you know the reason the city and the Book of the Revelation is called Smyrna. It was the largest myrrh mine. It got its name from this spice called myrrh. Smyrna. You live in a city Man. that gets its name after a spice that... I don't care how bad your cooking is. You can put the right spices in it. I don't care how bad your life is. You can add Jesus to it. I, I don't think. I, I burn the biscuits, but with Jesus, he can turn it around. He can turn your mourning into dancing. He can turn your sorrow into joy. He's able to take you out of darkness and put you in his marvelous Our God, you live in a city. You go to a church. You serve a God that is able. The gifts he received, just as a doctor got a stethoscope, Jesus got gold because he's king of kings and lord of lords. He got frankincense because he's the great high priest. He got myrrh because he's the atonement and there's nothing the devil can do about it. And they're going to sing this song today. I want to ask you a question before they sing. Wise men, wise men are still looking for Jesus. <laughs> I pulled up in food line parking lot minding my own business. Christy Burns pulls up next to me. I felt the Holy Ghost in the next car over. I, she didn't say nothing. I just, mm. And I looked over. And man, we was having a come to Jesus conversation. Right? He's coming again. I'm telling you, wise people are looking for his glorious appearing. Wise people are getting their nose in the book. Wise people are getting their heart right. Wise people are reprioritizing. Their, wise people are seeing the abomination of desolation. Wise people know a digital currency is right around the corner. A one world government is the agenda of government. There's a people that if you're wise, you will lift him up as king of kings and lord of lords and your great high priest and the atonement for your sins today. Who thinks you're wise today? Raise your hand if you think you're wise. Who thinks you're wise? I think I'm wise. Wisdom is not having all the answers. It's knowing what questions to ask. I'm going to ask you a question today. 
We understand the position and purpose of Jesus. So what is our gift to him today? What is our gift? Can I tell you what? It's not much of a gift if it don't cost you anything. I still love what Romans 12 and 1 says. I beseech you, therefore, brother, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. Well, I'm not too holy. You're not holy because you're holy. You're holy when you give it to God. He makes it holy. I'm asking as they sing this chorus today, who would come and say, God, I want to give you the best gift. I, I, I want to give you my worship. I want to give you my praise. Don't just go through the motions, but... Begin to lift up the name of the Lord. Begin to sing and begin to believe that all things are possible in His presence today.